Is Jesus really Jehovah God? That's our big question today on Theology 101. Hey, thanks for joining us. I'm Randy Bond, pastor of Aviana Baptist Church, and this is part of a series that we have been doing on basic Christian doctrine, who God is and who Jesus is, is our current uh, study that we're doing right now. So this is actually the fourth part of uh, a study that we've been doing on who Jesus is, what Jesus does. And in our previous episodes, uh, the last two in particular, we've looked at the nature of Jesus, and we have seen that Jesus is indeed God. We'll leave some links there so you can find those in the description down below or here in the top uh, right-hand corner. So you can kind of follow that train of thought in Scripture that leads us to the understanding that Jesus is indeed God. But the question is, is he the God or is he simply a God. And there's a big difference in the two. And as we saw before, that we need to have a correct understanding of Jesus to have a correct understanding of the gospel. And so this is the most important question that we need to ask is, what is the nature of Jesus? And if he's indeed God, as it's pointed out in scripture, and as we've seen in the last couple of episodes, is he really the God of the Bible or is he another God separate from him? So we're going to take a look at that, but before we dive in, we need to get a little bit of a Hebrew background and a little bit of a Greek background as well uh, to basically understand uh, the scriptures. And so let's take a look here. Uh, first off, and some of you may know this if you're watching this, um, that the generic word for God in Hebrew uh, is Elohim. Now remember the Old Testament uh, was written in Hebrew and some Aramaic, uh, and the New Testament was written entirely in Greek. Uh, now, the word Elohim can be used uh, for the God, uh, the creator of the, the universe. So in the beginning, God, the, in the beginning, Elohim uh, created the heavens and the earth, uh, or it can be used for pagan gods. So just like in English, where we can refer to the God or just gods uh, in general, maybe not meaning true gods, uh, it's a generic term. Uh, so it becomes very helpful in scripture when we see the divine name of God. So then there's no question, are we talking about the God of the Bible, or are we talking about uh, one of the false deities, one of the false gods uh, that might be out there, or a false idea of a God? So Jehovah, uh, or Yahweh, or Yavah, uh, is the, the Hebrew word, uh, the Hebrew name of God. This is how God revealed himself at the burning bush. Uh, so remember Moses encountered him uh, there and asked, you know, what is your name? And God says, my name is Yahweh, I am. And so uh, very important to understand that. And that's going to be critical as we go through this uh, study, because we're asking the question, is Jesus this person? Is he Jehovah God? Um, now, again, uh, a very helpful tool uh, when you're reading the Old Testament, and this is true only in the Old Testament, not in the New, if you're using some of the standard translations. So some of the uh, ones that are not going to be quite as accurate, they're going to be a little bit looser in the translation, may not follow this. Uh, but in, in generally the standard English translations and some of the other languages as well, whenever you see LORD in all caps in the Old Testament, Beneath that, in the Hebrew, is the proper name of God, Yahweh. So that sacred tetragrammaton, the, the sacred four letters, Y-H-W-H, uh, is the English equivalent of the Hebrew letters behind that, the yod heh vav uh, is where we get um, the, the, this understanding that we are talking about here, the sacred name of God. Now, in just a moment, we're going to talk about why uh, the translators use the word Lord there instead of putting his name. Uh, but it, that's important to know that anytime you see this, there's no question at all about who is being spoken of or who is speaking in the Old Testament. Now, another Hebrew word uh, to understand is the word Adonai. Uh, Adonai just simply means Lord or Lord. So it's either going to have uh, an uppercase, a capital L, uh, or it's going to be all lowercase. So the distinction is Yahweh is always going to be all caps in the English. Adonai, when it's referring to Yahweh, is going to have a capital L, and then the rest are going to be lowercase. Uh, however, Adonai can also be used of humans as well. So think of David the king. His subjects would have called him my Lord, my Adonai, and that would be all lowercase, unless it happened to be at the beginning of a sentence. But generally, if it's in the middle of a sentence and you see the capital L, 
This is Adonai as it's referring to God, as referring to Yahweh. And here's one case here uh, in Genesis 15 2, Abraham says, O Lord God. So in this case, the Lord is Adonai. Uh, so he's re uh, referencing God as the sovereign Lord uh, and gives that recognition. So notice that it has the capital L there uh, before God. Now, God is actually in all caps here because uh, God happens to be the proper name of God. So whenever you say Adonai, um, Yahweh together, it's usually translated as Lord God, with God being all caps. Uh, so the all caps uh, for God can also be the proper name of God. But typically, for what we're talking about, you're, you're usually going to see uh, Lord in the place there, unless it's Adonai, Yahweh. So that'd be a little weird, Lord, Lord, <laughs> uh, at that place. Uh, but that's kind of the sense that, that we can get. So the Shema, and this is going to be an, an illustration of why we get uh, Lord in this place. The Shema is a um, uh, really one of the most important verses for a Jewish per uh, person. It was then, it is now. A good Jewish person is going to recite this at least once a day, many of them uh, more than once uh, per day. And it's uh, that uh, in English, uh, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In Hebrew, it's uh, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. So you can hear in there a couple of times the proper name of God, Yahweh, in there. Now, years and years before Jesus came along, the Jewish people began the practice of instead of reading aloud the name of God, they would substitute Adonai in the place. So if they were reading this scripture in a public setting, reading it out loud, instead of saying, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our God, they would say, Hear, O Israel, Adonai our God. So they would just do a simple substitution in there as a reverence for the name of God so as not to potentially blaspheme the name or use the Lord's name in vain. They would say Adonai instead, or sometimes they may say Hashem, the name. Uh, but typically what we see, particularly in the practice in the, the pre-Christian era uh, of Judaism, is that, that the common practice would have been using the substitute word Adonai for Yahweh in the Old Testament. So again, Adonai means Lord, capital L, if it's talking about the God, uh, the master, or Lord, all lowercase, if it's talking about a human master. And this is the where that practice began. Um, kurios is the Greek word that means Lord or a Lord. And this is important, again, because the, the New Testament is written entirely in Greek, and this is the word that is very uh, frequently used in the New Testament, kurios, Lord. Um, so Adonai is the Hebrew word, and it means exactly the same thing as kurios, the Greek word, and that's the word Lord uh, in English. So again, that Lord could be all lowercase or it can be capital L. The context of who is being spoken of is the key. Now, this becomes important because in uh, the Septuagint, uh, the Septuagint is called the 70. Um, it's the, uh, the, the, the first uh, translation of the Hebrew scriptures. So around the, the, the middle of the third century B.C., uh, the Jewish people were kind of concerned about the Hellenizing of the world. The, the world was becoming increasingly Greek. Many of the people were speaking Greek. There's a little bit of concern that maybe the Hebrew language is going to be forgotten uh, or people won't be able to read it because they are only Greek speakers or primarily Greek speakers. And so they translate uh, the Bible uh, from Hebrew into Greek. And uh, so the entire Old Testament around 250 B.C., uh, was translated into the Septuagint, the, the Greek Old Testament. 6,800 times the translators of the Septuagint, of the LXX, translated Yahweh as Kurios. So remember, uh, the, the Septuagint is the Greek translation. The word for Lord in Greek is Kurios. And so they basically use that word Adonai, Hebrew. They use the Greek equivalent of that to translate the name of God over 6,800 times into kurios. And so this is going to be important because the, the, the New Testament writers followed the exact same pattern of the Septuagint using kurios for Lord. So anytime that you have an Old Testament scripture reference that references the name of God, Yahweh, in the New Testament, it's going to have the word kurios there instead of Yahweh. 
Now, this is important. Uh, the, nowhere in the New Testament, in the original Greek manuscripts, is the full name of God, Yahweh, recorded. The closest that we get is an abbreviated form at the end of hallelujah, like in Revelation 19. But nowhere in the Greek New Testament manuscripts do we find the proper name of God. So, you know, just kind of a side note, if this had actually been uh, problematic, that somehow uh, the mid-3rd century BC uh, Jewish people were doing something bad, um, it's kind of curious that, number one, Jesus never corrected that practice. And number two, none of the New Testament writers uh, saw that it was an issue that needed to be corrected. Uh, so using the word kurios is absolutely fine. <clears throat> but as we're going to see, it does present a little bit of an issue uh, when we're trying to understand very clearly about who is being spoken about later. And we'll see that in just a moment. So secondly, uh, we need to understand that one of the key teachings of the Old Testament is that there's only one true God. So again, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, very, very important doctrine, teaching of the Jewish people. That's the understanding of the Bible, of the Old Testament. There's only one God. Here's just a couple of places to uh, make that known. Deuteronomy 4.35. Uh, this is part of the Torah, uh, part of those uh, first five books of the Old Testament, part of the law. Uh, Deuteronomy was quoted by Jesus more than any other book of the Old Testament. So Deuteronomy 4.35, to you it was shown that you might know that Yahweh, the Lord, is God. There is no other besides him. So very clearly, as Moses is preparing the people to go into the promised land, he is reminding them, uh, you may encounter other deities uh, that are worshipped in uh, Canaan, uh, but there is only one true God. Uh, there are a lot of things that are called God, but there is only one true creator God, and that's Yahweh. Just a couple of verses later in uh, verse 39, know therefore today and lay it to your heart that Yahweh is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. There is no other. Uh, Moses does not allow for any uh, concept of another God besides Yahweh. Yahweh is exclusively God and God alone, as in the only true God. God is species unique. There's nobody like him. Um, and as we saw, Yahweh is his name. And again, the, the burning bush, this is where God reveals that. So all of that is important, uh, that there's only one God. Uh, Jehovah, Yahweh is his name. And yet we're going to see some very key things about Jesus as we look through the Old Testament passages, uh, as they're uh, brought about into the New Testament fulfillment. So when we look at um, the New Testament, where it says in many of these places, this was, uh, you know, to fulfill what was written by the prophet, or this fulfilled what was said then. Uh, there are a whole lot of prophecies that are recorded, written, or, um, you know, quoted verbatim, uh, or even alluded to in the New Testament, pointing to Jesus, who he is. And the way that we're going to understand this, um, since the Greek New Testament does not use God's proper name, uh, we can get a clearer sense by going back to the Hebrew rather than the uh, Old Testament, the, the Septuagint uh, version, the Greek version of the Old Testament, actually going back to the original Hebrew, uh, because it's the Hebrew and the Hebrew only that's going to have the proper name of God there, Yahweh. And so anytime in the New Testament that we encounter where Yahweh's name might have been in the Old Testament, it's really just like the Septuagint, only going to have kurios there. So anytime we find that word kurios in one of those Old Testament prophecies being recorded in the New Testament, the way that we can find out if we're talking about the Lord, um, or meaning maybe Jesus, um, or just a human Lord, or the Lord, Jehovah, is to go back and look at where that's quoted in the Hebrew Bible. So uh, let's begin our journey with uh, just some of the fulfillment of the prophecy about uh, the, uh, the the forerunner about John the Baptist that's going to be coming. So in Matthew 3, this is uh, what's said about John the Baptist. For this is he, John the Baptist, uh, who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So beneath this word Lord here is the Greek word kurios. Again, this is the Greek New Testament. 
Kurios is the word beneath that. But he is clearly quoting Isaiah. Um, the, uh, this is spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. So we know this is coming from Isaiah, but where in Isaiah? Well, it's pretty easy to find that because this is quoted uh, pretty much directly uh, from the book of Isaiah. And that's in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. But notice that the Lord here is Yahweh. It's all caps. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So the, 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 uh, Matthew is saying that, that John the Baptist's mission is to prepare the way of the Lord. But notice that it's, he's preparing the way of Jehovah that the one coming behind uh, John the Baptist is, in fact, Jehovah. So let's look a little bit further. There's any other, any other passages back that up. I mean, that's enough. But yeah, we can see in Luke 176, this is the prayer of, of blessing the prophecy of Zechariah, John the Baptist's father. And what he says about him is also a uh, drawing from uh, an Old Testament prophecy. And Zechariah says, and you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way. So is it just simply that he's going before Jesus, or is there something deeper in this word Lord? Well, this is coming from Malachi 3.1, where God says, Jehovah says, behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Notice that's first person singular. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says Yahweh, says Jehovah of hosts. So Jehovah is speaking and Jehovah says, I'm going to send my messenger and he's going to prepare the way before me. So who's coming after John the Baptist? According to these two passages, it's Jehovah who is coming after John the Baptist. This is getting significant. So, uh, oops, sorry, I got a little typo there. <laughs> um, notice John 19, 37. Um, and, and this is a passage, I just kind of let you know, when I was taking theology in university, um, uh, we were looking and comparing these very passages as well as some others. And this particular passage is what just wrecked my heart um, because this is where it kind of clicked as to the significance of who Jesus is. Now, I could tell you, you know, having grown up in, in church life, uh, that God the Son, part of the Trinity, Jesus is part of the Trinity, but I couldn't necessarily tell you why or necessarily the significance of that. So John 19, this is the crucifixion. And at this moment, uh, what has happened is that it's getting near evening and uh, the Jewish leaders are wanting to, you know, expedite the death process of the crucified criminals and Jesus. And so the soldiers come around to break the legs, uh, presumably so that they could not push up uh, on the cross and draw breath, so that they would basically asphyxiate much quicker. But when they came to Jesus, they find that he's already dead. And so just to make sure, this is where the Roman soldier thrust his spear into the side of Jesus and the water and the blood flow out, kind of indicating that the pericardial sac around the heart had been ruptured. Uh, so here's the evidence, but John is going to say, this actually fulfilled a prophecy. And, and he says, and again, uh, he's spoken of one, uh, not one of his bones shall be broken, first prophecy. And again, another prophecy that is fulfilled is what's said here. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him or they will look on the one whom they have pierced. Well, that's a direct quotation from Zechariah 12.10. They will look on me, whom they have pierced. Now, this is interesting because you need to ask the question, who is speaking in Zechariah 12? And particularly here at verse 10, because it's, again, first person singular. They will look on me, whom they have pierced. So who is speaking? Well, to find that out, we just need to go back up to verse 1. And verse 1 says, the oracle of the word of the Lord of Jehovah, of Yahweh concerning Israel. Thus declares Jehovah, thus declares the Lord, thus declares Yahweh. So who is going to be pierced? Yahweh, Jehovah says, 
they're going to pierce me. So who is on the cross? It's Jehovah. And this is huge. To understand how much Jehovah loves us is that Jehovah came in human flesh in order to take on our sin. Now, let me just pause right here. We are not saying that Jesus is the Father. We're saying that Jesus is Jehovah. And in our next episode, we're going to get into the Trinity where we flesh that out a little bit more, pardon the pun, uh, to see exactly the, the relationship, the nature of, of, of how God, uh, is, uh, how, what, what his being actually is and how he relates uh, to himself. Um, and, but here we can clearly see that Jesus is Jehovah and it's Jehovah that is pierced. This is what he is prophesying. They're going to look on me whom they have pierced. So just a couple of other references, and I won't go into those right now. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 4 through 8, and Isaiah 8, 13 and 14. And then Romans 14, 10 and 11, Philippians 2, 10. Philippians 2, 10, kind of that key point there. Uh, and then Isaiah 45, uh, 23. Uh, so just some other places there that are pretty significant, uh, pointing to who it is uh, that Jesus is. So let's look at some of the claims of Jesus. So we've looked at some of the New Testament fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. We've seen that those prophecies are really saying that this is going to be Jehovah who is coming, uh, Jehovah who's going to be pierced, um, the one who's going to be crucified. What does Jesus say? Now, some of these, if you've watched one of our previous episodes, um, are going to be um, redundant there because it, it's just it's significant. It's important. And we need to make sure that we cover those here. So first off is the I am statement of Jesus in John 50, uh, 8, 58. Uh, so if you watch the previous one, you know uh, that this is uh, during a pretty uh, intense encounter that Jesus has with the Jewish people. And uh, there's been some significant back and forth. And, uh, you know, he says, look, you know, Abraham longed to see my day. Uh, he, he rejoiced in that. And the Jewish people say, look, you're not even 50 years old. You know, and, and you say you know Abraham, like how would you know that? And Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, this is really big on so many levels, and we've talked about this before, so just kind of real quickly here. Number one, he's claiming to pre-exist Abraham. That's a divine claim in and of itself, because only God is eternal. Only he uh, has uh, lived before Abraham. Humans don't have pre-existence in scripture, nowhere. That is not a doctrine of the Bible anywhere. But we also see that he uses the I am statement. Uh, you see that most clearly in Greek. Uh, and so it's the same statement in Greek, ego I me, uh, in both uh, Exodus 3.14. We've talked about a couple of times already, uh, the burning bush moment where God reveals his name. Now we know that the Jewish people understand what he is saying because of their reaction. They understand he is claiming to be God here. He's using, he is invoking for himself, as himself, God's divine name. They fully understand that. And so they pick up the stones to stone him because that's the right reaction if he is indeed just a human making that claim. So the Jewish problem was not that they didn't understand what he was saying. They misunderstood who he was. And so that's why they, they missed that. Um, and then in Revelation 22, 12, and 13, we have Jesus making this claim. So there's no question about who is speaking here in Revelation 22. This is Jesus. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Now, so what's very interesting is that you're going to see the same statement said by the Lord God in Revelation 1, uh, where he says, uh, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Uh, but we also see uh, in Isaiah 44, 6, thus says the Lord, thus says Jehovah, thus says Yahweh, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, Jehovah of hosts. Notice he says, I am the first and the last. This is a statement, a claim of eternity, that he is eternal without beginning, without end, that he is before everything and after everything. How can Jesus make this claim if it is not true? And yet he does, and there's no correction to that. Uh, he makes the claim that is equal to God, 
equal to Jehovah, and there's no corrective to that. And again, just in case we're unsure, unclear about this, uh, besides me, there is no God. So there's not the possibility for Jesus, Jesus being another God, a God. He can only be the God. He can only be Jehovah, or we have a serious problem with Scripture otherwise. Um, Jesus claims to be the light of the world. In John chapter 8, verse 12, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Psalm 27, 1, uh, Jehovah is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? And then again in Isaiah 60, 19, uh, Jehovah will be your everlasting light. Um, Jesus also claims to be the shepherd. Uh, he says in John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. And most of us are probably familiar with that famous Psalm, Psalm 23, but we see that Jehovah is my shepherd. And if that's not clear enough, I, Ezekiel 34, 15, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep and I myself will make them lie down, declares Jehovah God. So this is a very significant statement that Jesus is making. He's claiming the same kind of role as Jehovah God. So let's look at some of the other important New Testament passages. And this is where it gets kind of fun. So um, first thing is, you know, who created all things? Who is the creator? You know, I, I think most of us can probably quote Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But just in case that's not clear enough, Isaiah 44, 24, uh, this is what Jehovah says. Thus says Jehovah, your redeemer, who formed you from the womb. I am Jehovah, who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. So Jehovah's understanding of who created is that he alone created. He, he does not include the possibility of an intermediary of lesser beings he is the full part and parcel of the whole of creation. He is everything about uh, uh, what happened in the creation moment. The angels got to witness it, but God did it. Jehovah did it. But when we get to the New Testament, we see in three clear places in the uh, New Testament uh, that Jesus is called the creator. Colossians 1, uh, Hebrews 1, and John 1, 3. We're going to look at two of those here. Uh, in Colossians 1, clearly this is talking about Jesus. Uh, for by him, by Jesus, all things were created. By the way, this is the same thing that Jehovah said about himself. Uh, Thus says the Jehovah, I am the Lord who made all things. And then we have the same thing said about Jesus. For by Jesus, all things were created. And just to spell it out, just to make sure we're clear on this, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, for Jesus. Hmm, that's pretty significant. That Jesus is the very reason uh, why creation was made. And so we can see that Jehovah is creator, Jesus is creator, John 1, 3, all things, same terminology, uh, were made through him. Not all other things. The Greek is simply all things. There is no need to add to the word of God. All things were made through him. And just to make it, again, cl very clear, crystal clear, John states it in the negative, without him was not anything made that was made. That means that everything that has ever been created, visible and invisible, heaven and earth, has the fingerprints of Jesus, so to speak. It is trademark copyrighted by Jesus. So he is the creator in the New Testament. But this is clearly what Jehovah is said to be in the Old Testament. This is also very huge. Who can forgive sin? Who has the right to forgive sin against God? Luke chapter 5, uh, this is the story, the, the moment uh, when Jesus is back in Capernaum. A lot of people have gathered uh, to hear him teaching, and they're just surrounding, and we understand from Mark, uh, Peter's house, uh, and there's uh, some people that come that have a, a friend who's paralyzed, and they're trying to get this friend to Jesus so that he can 
heal the friend. Uh, but there's no way to get uh, through the people, through the crowd. So somehow or another, they make their way up onto the roof, rip Peter's roof tiles uh, open, and lower the man in. Jesus sees their faith. This is where we're going to pick up now in verse 20. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. No one in Jewish life would have dared to say a statement like this. Verse 21, and you're going to see the reaction. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Here's the clear understanding. Only God can forgive sins against God. Who does this guy think that he is? This is indeed blasphemy uh, if he is not who it is. And this is the key problem that they have. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Psalm 130, verse 4, and you can also check Jeremiah 31, 34. But with you, Jehovah, there is forgiveness that you may be feared. Uh, it's very clear in the Old Testament. Jehovah is the only one who can forgive sins. Let me take you to this quote from C.S. Lewis. This is from uh, his book, Mere Christianity. And he says this, uh, and talking about this episode, he says, one part of the claim tends to slip past us unnoticed. Because we've heard it so often that we no longer see what it amounts to. I mean, the claim to forgive sins, any sins. Now, unless the speaker is God, this, really, this is really so preposterous as to be comic. We can all understand how a man forgives offenses against himself. You tread on my toes and I forgive you. You steal my money and I forgive you. But what should we make of a man himself unrobbed and untrodden on, who announced that he forgave you for treading on other men's toes and stealing other men's money. This is craziness to think of that. I mean, just picture this for a moment. Someone comes up to you, smacks you in the face. A bystander looks at the one who did that and says, oh, I forgive you. Now you're not just mad at the guy who smacked you, you're mad at the guy who had the audacity to say, I forgive you. There was no offense to him. So listen to how uh, Lewis wraps this up, his uh, assessment here. <laughs> and I love the language he uses. He says, asinine fatuity, <laughs> basically meaning there's not a shred of intelligent thought in this. Asinine fatuity is the kindest description we should give of his conduct. Yet this is what Jesus did. He told people that their sins were forgiven and never waited to consult all the other people whom their sins had undoubtedly injured. He unhesitatingly behaved as if he was the party chiefly concerned, the person chiefly offended in all offenses. This makes sense only if he was really the God whose laws are broken and whose love is wounded in every sin. In the, mouth, uh, in the mouth of any speaker who is not God, these words would imply what I can only regard as silliness and conceit unrivaled by any other character in history. Notice what Lewis is really astutely pointing out. You cannot forgive the sins against God. A mere human cannot. And if Jesus is making this claim, it either means that he is the stupidest, blasphemous, most blasphemous person, or that he is the God who has been offended and the God who can forgive. He is Jehovah in the flesh. This is pretty big. So uh, let's go back to the passage in Luke 5, verse 22. When Jesus perceived their thoughts, now notice the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees are not necessarily saying this out loud. Jesus knows what they're thinking. This is another indication of who he is. He is not merely a man. He answered them, why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise up and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, 
rise, pick up your bed and go home. And immediately he rose up before them, picked up what he had, uh, what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. Hmm. Notice he is not simply saying a declaration that I think that God has forgiven your sins. All of this healing was pointing to, to, uh, to who Jesus really is. He is the one who has the authority to forgive sins, not to just simply say the sins have been forgiven. That's a big, big distinction in the two. He is able to do this because of who he is. He is Jehovah in the flesh. And the very fact, and all of this is pointing to this, he's saying, so that you can know that I've got that authority, I'm healing this guy. And all of this is pointing, the very fact that that guy got up and walked is the proof that Jesus had the power and the authority to forgive his sins. Because at the heart of the problem was not a physical infirmity. The heart of the problem was a sin problem for this man. And when the root of the problem was taken away, the sin, the physical health was restored. And only Jesus could do that if Jesus were truly God, if he were truly Jehovah. So Je Jehovah is the forgiver of sins. Jesus is the forgiver of sins. Uh, third, whose name do we call upon for salvation? And Romans chapter nine is that great gospel passage that talks about how a person can be saved. And I'm going to pull just two of the verses, but you can look at the, the whole context there. Uh, this is verses nine and 13 and, and chapter 10. It says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and again, that's that word kurios, but there might be more to it than what we think, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So at first glance, when you're reading through this passage, we see that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you call on the name of the Lord, Jesus, you will be saved. But notice that he is quoting a passage here from Joel 2.32. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of Jehovah will be saved. But Paul is saying that if you call on the name of Jesus, you will be saved. So here is an interchange of the name Jesus and Jehovah. Here's a, a, a fun one. Who led the, ex, the Exodus? Who led the people of Israel out of Egypt uh, to the promised land? So in Exodus chapter 20, verse 2, this is the Ten Commandments, how they begin. It begins with this grace that God has given to the people, the recounting of, look, I'm your God. I'm the one who brought you out of Egypt. And he says, I am Jehovah, your God, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. But look at Jude 1, 5. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, Egypt afterward destroyed those who did not believe. So in Exodus, it's clearly Jehovah who leads the people out, who brought them out. And in Jude 1, 5, it's Jesus who has brought them out. Now I've got an asterisk by that. Uh, to be fair to the, the text, many of the early, and there's some pretty significant support for this, uh, that the originals um, probably had Jesus there. Now, some of the later manuscripts and quite a few more have um, the Lord there, kurios. So want to make that distinction, but there's enough early evidence in some of the early church fathers that had copied that as this. So when they saw the scripture, they quoted it as this in their letters. It's pretty significant. Uh, but this isn't the only place that we get Jesus's involvement in uh, the Exodus event. Um, and we see that more clearly here. Who did the people of Israel test in the wilderness? So in Exodus chapter 17, verse two, therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test Jehovah? So in Exodus 17, who, who are the people of Israel testing? Clearly they're testing Jehovah. But notice 1 Corinthians 10, 9, we must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. Wow. So the New Testament understanding, the understanding of the apostle Paul very clearly and most likely Jude is that it was Jesus 
who was leading the people in the wilderness and who they tested in the wilderness. In the Old Testament, clearly it's Jehovah. In the New Testament, it's pretty clear Christ is put in that same position, just used interchangeably. And this is uh, just one of those that's a little bit subtle. But who did Isaiah see? And you have to kind of read carefully to really get this. But when you do, wow. So John chapter 12, verses 36 through 42, this is right after the triumphal entry. Uh, This is recorded. And it says that when Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So that the words spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. So here's the first of two Isaiah prophecies that are going to be pulled in. First one is, Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Continuing on, verse 39, therefore they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, here's the second prophecy, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, uh, uh, many, even of the authorities, believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. So whose glory did Isaiah see? Who did he see? Let's go back to the beginning and notice at verse 36, second part of it, Jesus is the one who's been saying these things, and notice the the pronoun he. And in every one of these cases, the he is talking about Jesus. It's pretty clear, isn't it? Uh, So when Jesus said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. And uh, though he had done so many signs, they still did not believe in him. So we could substitute Jesus in every one of these places, right? So Jesus departed and hid himself, Jesus. And though Jesus had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in Jesus. Now, notice when we get to verse uh, 41, Isaiah said these things about him because he, Isaiah, saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, many of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. So who is the pronoun referring to here? Who is the antecedent of the pronoun to just use those, you know, grammar nerd words. Um, And the the connected part here is going back to the beginning. In verse 37, they still did not believe in Jesus. So even though Jesus had done all these signs, they still did not believe in him. And the him is clearly talking about Jesus here. And when we get to the latter part of this, after the Isaiah prophecies, notice many even of the authorities believed in him. So the object of the belief, who they're believing in, in the first part, Jesus. And that's clearly what John is saying here. Some of the, uh, many of the authorities did believe in him, but they hid it. They didn't want to get thrown out of the synagogue. And that object of the belief is Jesus. Notice from verse 41 to verse 42, there's no change in the noun. Isaiah saw his glory and spoke of him, the same him in verse 42 in the yellow. Isaiah saw Jesus's glory and spoke of Jesus. That's really the only way that this makes sense. I mean, to be clear in the Greek is simply a pronoun. That's one of those times I wish that John might have thrown in uh, Jesus's name, but it's still clear if you just take the time to read the passage. So the question is, when did Isaiah see the glory of Jesus? The clue is verse 40 of chapter 12, John 12. He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. This is a quotation from Isaiah 6. And if you're familiar with the book of Isaiah, you know how huge this is. And this is what it says there, make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. So who did Isaiah see? We go back to the beginning. So verse 10, where this is quoted, 
is in the context of this encounter. And the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, I, Isaiah, saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Skip down a, a verse, holy, holy, holy is Jehovah of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now what Isaiah does next is he is convicted of his sin and he falls down in worship and in confession. Woe to me, I am undone because I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen Jehovah of hosts. Hmm. And notice we, we said in that John passage that Isaiah saw his glory. Notice this is the only episode where Isaiah sees glory. He sees the glory of Jehovah at that moment. And John said that Isaiah saw Jesus's glory. So notice the NIV. Uh, I, I think it captures this correctly. Yes, it is a pronoun, but the context very clearly says this should be the name of Jesus there. So Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus's glory and spoke about him. Hmm. That's pretty big. So in Isaiah 6, who did Isaiah see? He saw Jesus. He saw Jehovah. He saw one person, one, one entity, one being, but it's one and the same. It is Jehovah. It's Jesus. Isaiah saw Jesus. He saw Jehovah. So a couple of other places like we did before, Romans 8 and 9, uh, and then Acts 16, verses 6 and 7, uh, Spirit of Christ is the Spirit of God. Um, and just kind of a, a heresy alert here, uh, Arianism, named for Arius um, around 290 AD, uh, late 3rd century, is a denial of the true divinity of Jesus Christ. And that takes various forms, um, but all agreed that Jesus, uh, all these false views that kind of follow the Arian thought, um, that Jesus Christ was created by the Father, that he had a beginning in time, he was not eternal. Jehovah's Witnesses are one of these, uh, but this was answered very clearly by the Nicene Creed in 325. Um, so again, we're, what we're saying in this is that Jesus is Jehovah God. We're not saying that Jesus is the Father. That's the discussion for the next time when we're talking about the Trinity. Uh, why do we believe the Trinity? That's how God revealed himself to be. Uh, but we'll talk more about that, the distinction between the Father and the Son. But very clearly, we can see the, the picture painted throughout the New Testament is, number one, Jesus is God. Number two, he is not just a God. He is Jehovah God. He is worthy of worship. He is, in fact, worshiped in Revelation 5. And all the passages going back and forth that we looked at, and even more, are pointing very clearly to the fact Jesus is Jehovah in the flesh. So, hope this has been a help to you. And if you've got questions or comments, um, you know, feel free to leave those in the, in the comments below. If they're legitimate questions, I'll be glad to uh, interact with you. Uh, if you're just a troll, um, you know, thanks for stopping by, but uh, move along. <laughs> uh, but I, I want to say thank you so much for, for watching. And it's just, uh, I, I'm honored that you would take the time to watch this. And if you're a believer, uh, especially, I, I'm so proud of you for taking this deeper dive. Because when we see who Jesus really is, it leads to worship. It leads to genuine worship. Um, and it is enriching in every way. It just is humbling. Uh, and it is thrilling. Uh, all at the same time. So uh, if you do have questions, feel free to, to leave those. Uh, if this was helpful, uh, if you don't mind, just leave a like there. Um, and if you'd like to follow this as we move on into the Trinity, again, hit the subscribe button, notification bell. I'm not trying to build a channel here. We're not monetized, not going to be, uh, but that would just help you to make sure that you get notified the next time we have a video come up about this subject or anything else that might be of interest to you. Hey, thanks for watching. Uh, we'll see you next time.